You are watching Notepad. I'm your host Ibrahim Sani. On the show, we have Moshin Aziz, the director of Pangolin Aviation Recovery Fund. Uh, this is because Pangolin Investment Management uh, a few months ago announced that they're creating this fund uh, to tap into the kind of possibilities and upside of the aviation sector. Moshin uh, spent uh, close to a decade at uh, Maybank Investment Bank and prior to that, he was the head of investor relations at AirAsia. And uh, having uh, followed his uh, career closely, we've had him on the show both in my previous career at BFM as well as here um, on Estrawani. We've had him on the show a few times. It's actually quite interesting to listen to his views. So, Moshin, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thanks for that introduction. And well, yeah, I mean, it's true because uh, there's very rare um, analysts uh, that we uh, would like to keep a close eye on. So, um, you know, this is kind of a loss for Maybank, but kind of a win for Pangolin. However, it seems like uh, when I say that Pangolin has created an aviation fund, there's a lot of conversation into people asking why the aviation sector, it's suffered a huge hit. Um, uh, because of the COVID, because of everything else, uh, this seems to be um, a sector that is going to die off a natural death. So why would Pangolin create the Aviation Sector Recovery Fund? Is there an upside to this sector? Okay, you've, you've pointed out our key investment thesis uh, right there, right then, actually. Um, yes, the industry is going through a huge crisis, perhaps the worst ever, and uh, there will be casualties. Not everybody will survive this particular crisis. It's really tough. But one question we ask to ourselves, does the world, does the human civilization need an, an aviation industry? And the answer is very resoundingly yes. The way we do things nowadays, the way we transport goods, uh, food, electronic, high value items, all needs an aviation industry. So uh, yes, we see it as an industry that deserves to survive, deserve to exist, and it will come back. And what we are trying to do now is if we can identify companies that we think will survive, uh, they will come out to be very, very strong in the future because they will be in an environment where they are less competitors people will still come back and fly and do what they used to do before. And in a consolidated environment, they've got better control, they have better pricing power, and therefore we think as a business, they will do a whole lot better in the future. So we see this whole crisis, as painful as it is, is actually an opportunity for the future. And hence, that's why we're doing it. Um, the thing about Pangolin is that you guys um, only buy um, and sell on the listed market and the aviation sector is filled with um, companies that are either government linked, not listed, privately held and all the other kind of business combinations that you can get uh, your hands on. Um, will there be an opportunity that you can't invest in and because of that you lose that opportunity just because they're not listed? Or are you going to continue on that mantra saying that you're going to still invest just for the listed entities? Well, our fund is set up whereby we have a mandate where we only invest in listed entities. Now, to invest in listed entities is actually simpler, more transparent and more cost effective as well. Uh, Non-listed entity investment takes a greater amount of time. Chances are you have to bring a lawyer in. So very, very likely it's painful, expensive and, and difficult process. Now, because we have a global mandate, we can invest anywhere around the world and we don't define what exactly is the limitation of aviation. Uh, there's a lot of broad opportunities because um, we don't see aviation as airline only. We see air aviation as an extension of airlines, airports, online travel agencies, because they, they play a part to each other anyway. Before you can take a flight, you got to go to an airport. Before you go to an airport, you have to buy the tickets first, and chances are you'll do it on uh, online travel agencies. And uh, basically, this is the whole ecosystem that we can invest in. Just to, identi just to highlight, um, the companies globally that we have identified 
as a possible investment into our fund, they number 155 and they range over airlines, airports, online travel agencies, terminal service providers, or the guys who are doing the repair and maintenance of aircraft, aircraft manufacturers, component manufacturers. So there's a plenty of, of investment opportunities. Yeah, just to stay within that listed uh, sphere. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the point that you raised just now. And, and, and that was a very uh, important factor that you mentioned, that the aviation sector is not just about the airlines per se. It's not just about the aircraft manufacturers. It's about the airports. It's about the retail people. My, my, my um, I, and, and MRO as well, um, uh, and repair and maintenance. Uh, what would not be inside the aviation sector? Would, would you... Would you imagine, say, for instance, um, the hotels or Airbnb, for that matter, are they part of that uh, aviation sector, so to speak? Well, there is actually a good link between tourism and the need to go for travel tours and hotels. So, technically speaking, they could be an extension to our fund as well. But for now, we are avoiding hotels or cruise ships and, and anything of that nature simply because I have zero expertise in them and trying to learn the schematics and dy dynamics of those particular industry will probably be very time consuming for, for us at the moment. So those are the things that are sort of related. You know, you could argue they should be, but for now, we're just avoiding them purely for the simple fact that we don't have any expertise in them. Let's talk a little bit more about your fund size and the kind of pool of investors that you have. How much can you share with us uh, with that regard? Well, not very much, unfortunately, because we're just really started right now. In terms of fund size, we're still quite small, uh, less than $10 million. But there's actually a whole host of investors who are in the process or getting internal approvals, or quite frankly, they just want to see how we do for the next two, three months before they decide to invest in us. So we're, we're at the initial stage where everybody's monitoring us and uh, doing due diligence before hopefully invest with us. So um, from our view, we don't see any limitation in terms of size. Uh, we can easily grow into a triple-digit million fund and we'll be able to mobilize them very efficiently because there's 155 companies as an opportunity today and these tend to be very large companies, very liquid companies. If we want to buy their shares and sell them, we'll be able to do so very easily. So that's where we are right now. Uh, still. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, you, you touched on a very important point just now. So does this mean that your fund will be able to short stocks? Um, and what would be the kind of investing duration that you look at when you want to enter these kind of markets and enter the kind of companies, that 155 sort of companies that are on your watch list? Uh, what's the strategy here when it comes to the duration of investment for those companies? Okay, um, I'll answer the first question first. Can we short? Technically, yes, but will we short? No, because um, we see this as a recovery play and our investment timeline is at least two to three years forward. So our forward vision is in the next two to three years, everything will be higher priced than what it is today, much higher price, hopefully. And therefore, if you get into this short game, it may distort your vision. It may distort your discipline and focus. So um, we don't want to get into that situation. So whatever we buy, it is with the sole feeling, sole comfort that it will be better. And it will be much, much better in the next two to three years because that's what our invest in, investment duration is more or less centered upon. So that's how we go about this. And then as to your mention, how do we pick one stock over, over the other? Well, a few things. We impose some value criteria. And before that, we'll ask this first question. 
does the company have a fundamental reason to exist? Meaning to say, if that, gov if that particular company is no longer in existence, will it bring material harm to the country and people? So some companies have that strong, resolute um, criteria, and those are the tend to be the companies that we are more comfortable with. And then second, we look into certain quality criteria like how good is the management, how good are their operation, and also things like financial metrics, how much money they have, and, and how good they are managing their costs. So as you do a lot of this homework, the winners, or let's just say the ones which are good, will shine itself. The qualities will be made, not, uh, we will know them, you know, you will, all the qualities will basically highlight themselves and that will turn into an investment decision. We generally just want to hold anywhere between 10 to 20 stocks in our fund at any given time. So trying to find that 10 to 20 stocks out of a pool of 155, uh, it's possible, you know, it's not daunting task. Yes, there's a lot of homework we need to do, but we'll get the 10 to 20 companies fairly quickly. Right. Uh, let's uh, look at the markets that you enter uh, right now. Um, I presume China is going to be a huge market for aviation, um, largely because uh, the two big uh, aircraft manufacturers, a bulk of whatever they produce and manufacture goes to China. Domestic travel has been a big hit for China. A lot of uh, Chinese uh, now have passports. Um, and of course, I'm talking about pre-COVID days, yeah? Um, but for the first quarter, second quarter, they've taken a hit. Third quarter has seen some recovery sign. And of course, the fourth quarter seems like uh, all the data shows that they are well on their way to recovery. Does this mean that a lot of opportunities are there in China when it comes to your, uh, building your portfolio? Well, you're right to say the whole world is vectored, right? But in terms of recovery, some countries recover faster than others. And nobody can beat China in terms of recovery. Uh, right now, domestically, uh, people are traveling more than they were one year ago. So this kind of like alludes that the recovery is already at hand. So yes, China is very high up in our radar. And in fact, we have invested in a few companies there already simply because uh, things are handled very well from a pandemic aspect and from a, from a people confidence, you know, they are very comfortable traveling within China. In fact, there was the uh, Shanghai uh, Marathon about a month and a half ago. So we have thousands of people running next to each other without a mask and it's okay. So things are pretty much back to normal. So um, we believe China will be a template for the world. At some point of time, whatever you see right now in China will replicate itself in other parts of the world. Maybe in Southeast Asia where we stay now, eventually you'll go to Europe and America. So that's how we're going to mobilize our funds and our investment as we see the recovery moving from China to, let's just say, South Korea and Japan, which is starting to see that benefit, we will mobilize more investments there. Next on our radar, I think uh, Australia, New Zealand will probably be enjoying that sort of recovery as well. And thereafter, we will, we'll have to wait and see who's next, whether it's Southeast Asia, Middle East, Europe, America, but as the numbers or data shows, we'll make that decision. Yeah, that's the thing about um, uh, companies like yourselves. You're very, um, I should say, unemotional about finding um, investments. But uh, you guys are located in Southeast Asia. And the thing about Southeast Asia is that a lot of countries, including Malaysia, are still struggling to had to get a good grips on how we can handle COVID. Um, and, and one company uh, in the aviation sector that screams uh, that needs to be talked about is, of course, Air Asia. And of course, very recently we saw Air Asia disposing their um, investment in Air Asia India, um, selling a bunch of shares um, to Tata. Uh, and of course, uh, Bo Lingam, uh, the boss of um, Air Asia Aviation, was talking about how this is meant to improve on their cash flow. 
What they're doing is not unique. What they're doing is actually quite similar to what all the other airlines around the world, particularly budget airlines around the world, are doing. They're trying to improve on their cash flow. Uh, I don't know whether this is uh, uh, enough for them. What's your view on this, uh, Mohsin? Well, what they're doing is basically consolidating, you know, getting rid of um, their future investment plans for what is core and central to their business right now. I mean, AirAsia is a forward visionary company. So they have strong commanding market share in Malaysia, Thailand, and one could say in Indonesia too. But beyond that, they see future opportunities in Philippines, Japan, and India. Now this may work, this may not work, but they are giving it a try. But now that it converge with a period of this COVID pandemic, all these future investments are bleeding a lot of cash and it's a strain to the overall group. So if you continue to do this, right, your forward future plans would probably bring the whole company down and there's no future after that anyway. So that's when the company had to sit down and reassess what is core to us, what's really fundamentally important today, because we can't talk about tomorrow and 10 years from now. We got to talk about today. And that's why they took the decision, sell the uh, JVs that were underperforming in the likes of Japan, India, I'm not sure if uh, other JVs will come into the fray, but uh, basically their core market is Malaysia, people in Malaysia flying domestically and regionally, and that's where they have to reposition their entire business. I hope it's enough because at the end of the day, they have a fundamental reason to exist. Malaysia needs to travel. Um, we have a big South China Sea in between Sabah, Sarawak and the peninsula of Malaysia. So you, you need uh, a flourishing aviation industry. And not to mention, there's a lot of regional travel, migrant workers. Given a choice, they will try to take a flight. They don't want to go into the days where you will take a boat and go all over with a boat. So uh, with all that quality in check, we believe that they have what it takes to survive. Fantastic. Uh, we'll go for a short break. When we come back, we continue our conversation with Mohsin Aziz of the Pangolin Aviation Recovery Fund. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. This is Notepad. I have with me Moshin Aziz, uh, ringing in from Singapore. Moshin, let's move away from the fund per se and let's talk about some of the ideas that uh, is circulating in the Malaysian aviation sector per se. Um, and uh, one such topic is of course Malaysia Airlines. We've been covering Malaysia Airlines for the longest of time. This is a company that continues to create headaches for all uh, investors and the government as well. How do you think the story of Malaysia Airlines will end eventually? Will they be bought out by a suitor? Is Japan Airlines one of them? What's the story for Malaysia Airlines? I think during a pandemic, the appetite for buying out or let's just say mergers and consolidation, that appetite is pretty much suppressed because everybody's going to think about their core fundamental market. They're going to just think about their home market. And therefore, thinking abroad, thinking overseas, it's pretty much not high in their to-do list. So um, I'm not saying that Japan Airlines and Malaysia Airlines uh, deal is off. We've not seen any announcements. But I think from a practical point of view, it's not something high on the agenda for both managements, I can presume. It simply doesn't make sense. Uh, you're not going to do this merger or marriage over Zoom call, right? You need to face to face each other. And in this current climate, it's just not possible because of the uh, quarantine measures and all those stuff. So at the end of the day, I think uh, Malaysia Airlines have to take care of itself. 
and they really have to look deep into the current situation because what the pandemic has uh, done, right? It really, really shows every level of weakness that everybody has. So whatever weakness that the uh, airline has, the management has, will be magnified. So in the case of Malaysia Airlines, we can see that um, fundamentally, uh, their international flights probably not doing well and need to exist because um, those who are coming to Malaysia right now, they are doing so via other means despite their quarantine measures. And it's only a selected countries around the world where there is a flourishing in and out of uh, passengers into Malaysia. So those probably are the countries that Malaysia Airlines should focus. A lot of others, they probably could actually uh, discontinue it altogether. So if anything, I think this crisis will give a clear data to the management of Malaysia Airlines. We need to resize the company. And, and because of that, the saga continues, so to speak. Uh, that's your, I guess, outlook on the company. Well, the thing is, Malaysia needs an airline. And um, I think we need more than one airline. I don't think Malaysia Airlines in itself, on its own, can cater to the demands and requirements of all Malaysians. And on that respect as well, I don't think Air Asia can do that either. So I, I really believe there is room for maybe two airlines in Malaysia, be it Malaysia Airlines and Air Asia, or something else, I, I don't know. But I certainly hope that it will be one form of Malaysia Airlines and the other part Air Asia. Um, let's uh, now talk about Boeing and Airbus. Both of them have some issues to be dealt with. Um, top of mind include uh, Boeing and their 737 MAX, um, Airbus with the allegation of corruption, um, including that of uh, with AirAsia actually. Uh, so they have their own, um, I guess, drama to contend with. But what's the story for the airline manufacturers, sorry, the aircraft manufacturers right now? Are they facing a bleak future? It is tough because uh, all these years they've spent billions and billions on building bigger planes, uh, planes that can go for long and, and consume much less fuel. But unfortunately, right now, uh, airlines are not really flying what they have, you know, they're only using bare bones aircraft into their operations. And there's certainly no appetite to buy big airplanes because uh, the number of long haul flights right now is really, really bare bones, very little. So it's it's really tough. They, they have a product that have, they have spent so much money on, but there's just no interested sellers. In fact, We've been speaking to a lot of airline executives all around the world and also uh, airports, you know, companies that manages airports. The trend that we see right now is airlines want to choose the smallest aircraft that they have in their fleet to connect their flights. So let's just say, for example, they used to use a big Airbus A380 to connect from London to Malaysia, they're downsizing to, let's just say, a Boeing 777. If they can right now, during this crisis, they'll use the smallest aircraft that they have. And this is hold true for domestic and regional flights as well. Now, it is very understandable because demand is so suppressed. You don't know if you can fill up your aircraft with a lot of people. And therefore, by using a smaller aircraft, it's, it's lower cost and you know your planes will be filled up. It's very simple investment decision. So the, unfortunately, both Boeing and Airbus, they don't have small aircraft. They've always been focusing on building bigger and bigger planes. And that's why this particular crisis is a double whammy for them. But for us in Pangolin Aviation Recovery Fund, we see this as an opportunity 
because we invested in a company that specialize and builds small aircraft only. They are called Embraer and they are based out of Brazil and they are doing very, very well. All their aircraft are being used uh, very heavily right now and uh, there's hardly been any cancellation of orders from their customers. So it's a very unique situation. We are undergoing a crisis, but the two big boys in the aircraft manufacturer are struggling. Smallest brother, the youngest, smallest brother is the one that's doing very well. So that's the world we live in and we see this as an investment opportunity. Yeah, fantastic because uh... That duopoly has always been questionable in, ta uh, in the eyes of investors as well as uh, market observers. Um, you know, I, when, I went, when I went to uh, Seattle to look at uh, the new Boeing 777 and 737 and I went to Toulouse uh, to look at the um, uh, Airbus, um, uh, uh, the one that Malaysia Airlines bought, A350. Uh, it seems like uh, they can't, they're not nimble, that's for sure. Um, and for them to rechange the strategy midway, it's going to be problematic for the business program that they have to speak of. And you know, when they cancelled A380, it was something that was debated for a few years before they actually announced the A380 um, uh, uh, discontinuation. Uh, and because of that, I think smaller companies, yeah, I agree, would be a little bit more quicker and nimble in terms of servicing the needs of their clients. But having said that, we have to draw this conversation to a close. Um, and it's, it's a privilege to speak to you. And, and we've, uh, we want to have you more, uh, particularly as the fund grows even more. Uh, but for now, what would be some of the key takeaways that you want to share with the audience when it comes to the aviation sector and how it relates to COVID-19? What would be some of the three things or two things uh, that you want to let them know? Oh, precisely. First thing, aviation industry will survive. Um, unfortunately, not in its current form. There will be some casualties, but eventually when all the casualties happen, what we are left with is a far more precise, more efficient and with stronger players. And therefore, choosing the right companies that will survive right now will surely be a very Mm, rewarding investment strategy for the future. So that's what, that's the key takeaway of our fund basically. Fantastic. Invest in survivors okay. and the survivors yeah. will do very well. All right. Um, stay safe in Singapore. Um, we'll hook up when we get back to KL again. Uh, but for now, we have to draw this conversation to a close. That was Moshin Aziz, the director of Panglin uh, Recovery Aviation Recovery Fund. Sorry, I bungled the company name. Uh, but if you missed any part of this uh, show, just head on to astroawani.com. Look for Notepad over there. You can also uh, watch these kind of shows on all your mobile devices. Just download the Astro Awani app wherever you get the application. Until then, thanks very much for watching. Until next time.